This is Coffee with Cool People. I'm Chip Moon, and I'm excited to be spending some time with Chris Hanley. Chris, how are you? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks you for know, having me. This is a, a great example of why I do this show. You and I have known each other for more than two decades, uh, right. all the way back to my Kiwanis Club days. And um, But it's always great to get kind of caught up and reacquainted. And so, yep. um, yeah, we were... Uh, reintroduced I guess is a, a good way to put it by my dear friend Angie Ward and um, she said you know do you know Chris Hanley and I said well I mean do you ever really know anybody <laughs> right but right. Um, and I said yeah I know Chris we were in Qantas Club together and, and she said when's the last time you talked to him and I said probably 15 years ago <laughs> so um, great to get reacquainted is exactly why the show exists and you know Back a long time ago, uh, I knew you as um, one of, if not the pastors of First Pres. Associate pastor. Associate pastor, mm -hmm. thank you, uh, of First Pres here in Florence. And now right. you're the executive director of Helping Florence Flourish. Before we get into where we are today, I'm, I'm curious, who is Chris Hanley? Uh, well, I can try to give you a little bit of an answer. So um, Chris Hanley is married to Dottie Hanley. We've been married 37 and a half years. We've got three grown boys. We have three daughter-in-laws and two grandsons and two on the way. Two grandsons on the wow. way. So that's all we can do is boys. So I understand. You know, that's very exciting. And um, and so uh, we came to we. Well, I'll say this first. We met back at NC State way back in the day. We were both North Carolinians. Grew up, I grew up in Charlotte. Dottie grew up in Raleigh. And uh, we were there during the glory year in 1983 when Belvano took the pack, the cardiac pack, to the championship. Uh, we courted around that event. And, uh, and then we got married in 85 and went to Richmond, Virginia and worked with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship for six and a half years and then moved up to Boston to go to seminary. Felt the Lord calling me to continue to uh, move toward ministry and got a Masters of Divinity. And ironically, we ended up back in Richmond for another eight years serving as an associate pastor at Crestwood Presbyterian Church. And then in 2002, a group of wonderful people called me to come and be the associate pastor at First Presbyterian. And so I've just finished 19 and a half years of associate pastoring at First Pres and uh, have taken up the executive directorship of helping Florence flourish, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, I look forward to, to talking about that. Um, now, when you were at NC State, did, did you always expect that you were going to be in the ministry? No. And, um, you know, went to NC State, probably not really following the Lord and not really um, serious about anything spiritual but as you know you do your freshman year it's a little bit crazy and then <laughs> after that began to get serious about faith and it was involved in young life leadership as a sophomore and then ended up in intervarsity as a junior and senior which ended up sending me to the Philippines for a couple months uh, during between my first senior year and my second senior year and uh, and then um, that sort of catapulted me toward ministry and university invited me to come on staff. And so wow. I served at the University of Richmond and Virginia Commonwealth Universities up there. Uh, so those were wonderful years. We were starting to have have a family and sure. fun times up there. Yeah. What, um, what about the Philippines do you feel like kind of pulled you into? Oh, I was reading a book called Knowing God by J.I. Packer while I was uh, on the mission field, so to speak, and uh, the experience of walking with the Filipinos through the rice paddies and living in the middle of the rice paddy for weekends and and um, watching them follow God and, and just the reading about who God is really did inspire me and made me, made me really think, huh, this is something I really need to pursue. Sure. So... That's it. Wow, that's that's awesome, and what a great experience for a young person. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, there was one little event that was always stands out about the Philippines. Where I was coming home from a weekend in the rice paddy and headed back to the 
headed back to the school I was teaching English in, which is ironic that I was a teacher of English, but um, there was a school for Filipino elementary students, and they were playing in the front yard before school started, and then they saw this really white guy walking by. A couple of them saw me at first, and they come up to the fence and put their faces on the fence, and then they call their friends, and so by the end of the time passing, there are 300 kids standing at the fence wow. watching the white guy go by. <laughs> and I am pretty white, so, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you, know, you say it's ironic that you'd be teaching English. English. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm sort of, I'm an English speaker, but to be a teacher sure. of English is uh, a whole different well, thing. Well, you know, they say, uh, what is it in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So, <laughs> exactly. I, you know, so, so. <clears throat> great analogy. Yes, that's about what it was. And, and uh, we had a great time. I lived with the Filipinos, which was unique. The missionaries lived in their homes and as families and because I was a single guy there by myself I lived in the dorm with them and, right. and really had a great experience yeah it's really special that's fascinating so fast forward yep they recruited you they came up recruited you to be the associate pastor here in First Press yep. at First Press what was your first kind of impression of Florence uh, we were at Ada and Alva Whitehead's place out on Pocket Road, and we we drove into the driveway, which is, it's very, um, you know, uh, um, when you have a mansion out in the country, it's um, you know, set your way back and. Um, we drove in and uh, a peacock landed on the car <laughs> and started looking at the, the mirror because it saw itself. And uh, this was like a first experience and we felt like we'd stepped back in time and, and um, the folks were warm and, and just really genuine. And uh, that was a, one of our first experiences here. Wow. Yeah, you probably know the Whiteheads. They're I great do. folks. Yep. Yeah, what, what's the pitch? So when somebody says, you've got to come and move to Florence. Well, I mean, they, uh, what they said to me, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, it was, there were, uh, the, the church was a strong church. And so you could tell that as the people were interviewing you. And, and uh, the pastor at the time, Roger Gulick, was excellent in, in my mind. And uh, he was the kind of leader that I would looked forward to working with. Sure. And so um, those those sort of things really compelled me to move here. And uh, so it's been a, a great ride. Yeah. 19 and a half years. The peacock. I mean, it's hard I to mean, be hey, a peacock I mean, on your yeah, birthday. I know, yeah. It's awesome. So. <laughs> now, though, you are um, the executive director of Helping Florence Flourish. Yes, sir. What is that? Tell me about Helping Florence Okay, Flourish. Helping Florence Flourish really was born from some reading I did. A guy named Glenn Barth wrote a book called The Good City. And in it, he talks about movements in cities that are set aside, especially to try to pull the church together to bless the community. And, you know, I always ask the question, how many churches are there in Florence? And people start going, well, yeah, eight, four, five, six. And it's a trick question. There's only one. There's only one. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but the mindset of folks is not that way. I mean, we live in our silos. We have our, our building, and, and that's where we do our thing. And, um, and so uh, a gospel city movement, which Helping Florence Flourish is, of which they're probably about... Uh, 350 gospel city movements around the United States. There's one in Richmond, there's one in Charlotte and Atlanta and Columbia. Um, and they all have a similar bent or call on them, and that is to pull the church together and therefore help it bless the community. That's the quick way to talk about it. Okay. And, uh, and so I do pastor gatherings monthly, trying to pull pastors together. Uh, 
to uh, work around certain areas that need attention, like uh, we're trying to develop a education network that helps schools. Been working recently in conjunction with uh, um, Ron Pruitt and the Good News Club uh, that they do because they're in every elementary school sure. in in Florence, which is amazing. But can we can we create a network where uh, we are able to uh, bless a school and its administration in such a way that the school actually improves? Um, you know, I know. Um, Dr. O'Malley is really thinking of that, and I saw that in the news journal that recently where they had gave the grades and the sure. schools were coming up. Can we even come behind that and even help them even more? Right. So networks like education, house repair, um, um, leadership development, uh, things like that. And so um, I'm excited about it attempting a lot of that. Some of that's still very much in the dreamy stage, sure. but it's it's um, exciting. we got a board of 12 people we meet okay. tonight and um, talking about what's going on and what we're what we've just done and what we're planning to do and so it's exciting. So did did you start helping Florence? Yeah, Flourish? yeah. So, I guess I got distracted from myself. The, the Glenn Barth book really did inspire me. I sat down with Eric Marischal and Chris Scott and said, hey guys, what do you think about this? And there was enough interest um, to say, hey, let's see what happens. So we invited Glenn Barth to come to Florence. He guided us through a process of doing interviews uh, where we ask about three or four questions. What are the what are the your primary concerns about the community? We were interviewing leaders, and so we asked them, "What are your primary concerns about the community?" Uh, and then that's probably the first big question. The second big question: Are you willing to work with others to try to address those issues? Sure. And so we did that with sixty-five leaders. Came up with four different areas of concern, and uh, and so we got started. And um, it was interesting. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Steve Wakila was involved, and we met in uh, Cumberland United Methodist and launched Helping Florence Flourish, and began to try to think about these networks. Right. And uh, racial bridging came out on top as the biggest concern. And uh, that's probably where we've done the most work. We had Tony Evans in town in 2016. Uh, we had Nettie Winters. Last spring we had Natasha Seastrunk Robinson, an author from Orangeburg, South Carolina. All of them addressing racial needs and concerns. And so um, it's been great. Um, you know, it, I have this vision in my head that when we get to heaven, everybody's going to be around the throne. It doesn't matter. Every tribe, tongue, and nation will be there. And if we want the kingdom of God to come now as we pray on a Sunday morning, it would be incumbent upon believers to learn how to image that here now rather than waiting. And so trying to pull the races together and even love each other and care about what each other's doing and how to support each other and how to even work together to bless the community we're in. So those are all big dreams. Sure. It's, it's a, fun. Racial bridging was one. Yeah. And I, I don't want to put you on the spot. Ra restoration of the family. Okay. Homelessness and education. Gotcha. We added one, which we, we didn't pop up as a, one that the leader said, but we feel like it's very important, and that's prayer. And so we have a citywide prayer gathering every month, and we try to move from church to church to do that. So those five things are really our sure. priorities. Well, so I've found in, in my time in the church that... It's easy sometimes for people to get a little territorial. Oh, yeah. You know, um, how has uh, a movement like this been received? Uh, you know, it's been received well in some respects, but sure. then those are the people that are showing up. And, and uh, there's at least two reasons why people don't show up. One is they're really busy and they just can't 
add anything else, which is totally understandable. Sure. Or they they don't see it as something that they need to put time in and work out. And so, but the points who come, they're all in. And uh, we met at Trinity Baptist this last month. Uh, that's Calvin Robinson's church. And, right. And um, we were sh- probably about 20 of us in the room. And uh, Matt Walton from Trinity Press shared their experience during something we call Serve Flow. It's a season of service that we sponsor. And it was so inspiring. And everybody came away going, man, this is awesome. And so um, the, the pastors were encouraged. They were challenged. And that's exactly what you want to see happen. And so I know watching that room is they were glad they were there. And, uh, and so um, we're, we're feeling our way through. Sure. We, we're somewhat creating it as we go, but um, uh, you see fruit of it. Well, I think like any young endeavor, the more success that you can have, the more inspiration that you can provide to any of the participants, we'll call them, I think that that spreads out over, you know, somebody once told me in in regards to something completely different, everybody has a best friend. Yep. And and I think even in the ministry community, even locally, the, you know, for folks who aren't participating yet, my supposition is that, you know, somebody in the room gets inspired and they're going to tell the next person and next time you've got 21 or 22 and then you've got, and and I think that's ultimately, and, and two, Again, going back to that territorial nature of things sometimes, I think the longer that uh, an organization goes on and people realize that they're true to what they say they are, Mm -hmm. this isn't a cannibalization of something, it's meant to be additive, then I think that over time, people buy in a a lot more. What's been the hardest part so far? The hardest part? So I stepped into the executive directorship in January without, you know, if you step into something that that exists, there are rhythms, patterns that are set that you just got to step into and fill. Sure. Um, There's no rhythm, really. And so it's, what do you... What do you spend your time doing? What are the things and the priorities? And and then how do you organize yourself to do that? And so that's probably been the biggest challenge. I mean, I'm a little suited for it because I'm not, my bent is not necessarily regimented. Right. And so actually it works okay. But um, that's been the biggest challenge. But, uh, and, you know, and some nonprofits would say finances is probably the biggest thing. Sure. Actually, it's not right now for us. Now, that's not to say that we don't need sport, but we've been blessed in this season. Sort of as a startup, First Prez is helping sure. helping it happen for me to get paid and things sure. like that. And so that's that's been good. So they'll uh, in a three-year season, they'll they have set it up so that uh, it will gradually come down, but they're essentially paying us salary for three years, sure. which really helps. So Absolutely. the main thing is uh, the patterns, the rhythms. What is it exactly? And so, um, like even tonight, we'll talk about what, what are the things that we need to do as a board and as an executive director, what do I need to do in the days to come? So mm-hmm. that's good. Yeah, well, what do you model it after? Because it, at least for me, right? Because yeah, there's nothing. Six or seven years ago, we went from a, a company that was set up to a bit of a startup to some extent, and, and you have to model it after something. So right. I'm curious when, when you start trying to figure out. All right, now I have a blank slate, which is really cool and scary at the same time. Right. How, how do you so decide? So there is, you know, the Gospel City movement has a fraternity of sorts that's out there that um, you can glean best practices from. Okay. Uh, And so I'll look over my shoulder at some of these other Gospel City movements that are a little older and go, hey, 
what the, the, look at what they're doing. Maybe we should pursue that. And there are a lot of tools that have been developed that are being used, one of which we used it in August called Global uh, Leadership Summit, which is a leadership development tool that came out of Willow Creek up near Chicago. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, they are about trying to help leaders grow sure. from a Christian point of view. And, and so we, we hosted their virtual conference, and, and we'll probably do that again. But the, that's just an example of a tool that is out there that Gospel City movements are tapping into. Sure. And so there's a lot of those that are popping these days. And we have, we have monthly Zoom calls where we are in association with one another. I'm in a cohort that's different than that call of smaller group of Gospel City movement leaders and and we talk about what we're doing with our weeks what we're doing with our months what are our goals and and then they always have best practices that they're trying to bring across our path and, and help us with so yeah it's good well i would think it's also locally um you know again when you talked about first prayers kind of making a commitment to help oh yeah um it, and, i would amazing. have to think locally there's kind of some proof of concept there right I, I, if i understand Lighthouse correctly. I mean, that's one of the ways that Light, Lighthouse got started, if not one, but several churches mm -hmm. identified a need, got together, yep. and said, we're going to do this for a season. Right. And, and then you know, it became more, at least more self-sufficient. I yep. don't know anything about their finances, but I, I think locally there's some, I would think there's some ability to get some buy-in based on previous local experience. Right. And, you know, we've been very supported by the city. The city's been really helping us in the sense that uh, it's not for operational costs, but for ministry costs. Not that they are, uh, their, their monies is helpful for things like housing needs, which sure. they would be concerned about. And they know that we're trying to do something in that area in a neighborhood uh, to fix a house. Also, uh, Helping Florence Flourish is associated with a network of homeless shelters like House of Hope and Salvation Army, Naomi Project, um, PD Coalition, and, and CAP. Um, the city appropriates a good chunk of change to create uh, an incentive to collaborate and to help people. And, and we, Helping Florence Flourish, helps administer those funds. Okay. And so, so we got a lot of favor in the community in the sense that you know, people like that, churches, we have several churches, not just First Press, that are involved in helping support, helping Florence flourish. So it's it's a good start. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. great. So uh, I'm, I'm curious, what has been the thing so far that you're most either pleased about or proud of? Uh, that's hard. A couple things jump in my head. I, uh, the pastor count time is really, really significant because I really believe the kingdom is built on relationships. And, and so given pastors, which are leaders of congregations, the opportunity to know one another and to encourage one another, uh, that is so helpful because pastors tend to, they're sort of in a different place and they need that kind of relationship so that that's been a good thing we built a house that's pretty significant um, and a woman was living in a rat infested home that was falling apart and um, so in collaboration with the city actually the city did, um, demolished it for us which was about a five thousand uh, dollar gift and, and then we built a, a house back on her property, which is really cool. And she moved in in July of this year. So that was significant. And, and currently we're helping refurbish another house for another young lady, um, which is a neat story that's been in the, in the news. Um, the uh, Leo graduated from House of Hope's program. Right. She was homeless. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, House of Hope at the same time had been given a house over a McQueen as a gift, which you would think 
that a ministry like that would sell that house and, and use the funds to help perpetuate the sure. ministry. Well, Brian Braddock decided, and I'm sure the board was involved too, to give the house to Aaliyah. And so now she's a homeowner. Mm -hmm. She has the deed in her name. And the only problem is it's not livable yet. And so helping Florence Flourish has been able to step in and, and try to help, help refurbish. Yep. So it's been fun. It's well, been that's, fun. it's interesting because you touched on a couple of different things. One is is tangible and visible yep. in, in terms of I can ride down the street and see this house that that I built, but then also the the invisible of what I'll kind of call the scaffolding around the Florence leadership community in the churches, yep. which I think is, is neat. And one of the things that I, I think that any leader needs is a group of other leaders to be able to, whether it's um, have support to commiserate with, mm -hmm. because it's a unique position, and I would think ministry is even even more so, but it, it's it's hard to find other people who can understand kind of all the different needs and pressures and um, you know, struggles, if you will, yeah. that, that folks are into. And I, I would think that in ministry, you're completely vulnerable, or uh, you know, particularly vulnerable to that. Yeah. It really does. The, the the pastors need that kind of connection, and and it's they can uniquely give it to each other, which is good. Especially now, you know, the turf thing is part of the thing that you're trying to pull down mm -hmm. a little bit, and uh, and so this kind of engagement helps with that too. For sure. Well, and I would I would think, like you said, I, look, all business is a people business. Oh yeah. You know, uh, and. I would think that it would be, uh, it could be challenging, particularly for folks who've been here for a while. You're not the new person in town coming around to meet all the, you know, for, for established um, you know, professionals to call on one another would be hard. Mm -hmm. But having a third party, you know, to, to come in and call everybody together, you have an opportunity to actually make some personal connection in what I'd consider to be a, a less vulnerable space where yep. it's not you and I, and I've called you to have a conversation. For a lot of people, that'd be even for people who are in a, a ministry profession, that can still be weird. And so the, the ability to have somebody else facilitating that get together, that conversation, I would think is really valuable for the people who are participating in it. Yeah, I hope so. That's the goal, the goal for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, so Chris, one of the things that I like to ask just because I think it's fun okay. is um, kind of in wrapping up is kind of just something to get to know you a little differently. <laughs> um, if you could pick a fictional character could be book, movie, superhero that you feel like best represents Chris Hanley. Who would it be and why? Uh, well, I have a couple thoughts. Um, I know the one I'm going to go with, but I, you know, I love Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings and all those guys and uh, the battle and that's really good. Um, Sam Ganji's a really neat guy in, in the in the the way that he helps Frodo. Um, but the one I'm going to go with is Mowgli in Jungle Book. Three off, I know, because I was going esoteric, and then no, not so esoteric. I'm <laughs> Mowgli. I like the Jungle Book. <laughs> yeah, Jungle Book's awesome. So, um, you know, fun. I think of myself as Mowgli because Mowgli is on this adventure, and he's out doing some crazy stuff and uh, certainly the the jungle animals come around him and help him along the way uh, but uh, I, I like the adventure I don't know quite what I'm doing a little bit and I feel like Mowgli had no idea sometimes what he was doing and uh, that's I, I can identify with with that and uh, it, but it's exciting you know for sure so it's good stuff that's awesome. Well, Chris, I wish you uh, great luck on your adventure. I can't wait to see all the different things that Helping Florence Flourish is going to do, and I appreciate you spending some time with me. Yeah, Chip, it's been great. Thank you so much. Yes, sir.